um, there's a, a video about udder scoring on the um, beef and lamb website now. Um, and the reason it's four to eight weeks post uh, weaning is to give time to the udder to um, regress a bit because um, some of them will still have a bit of milk in there and it makes it easy to feel some of those traits. So there's quite a big difference. Well, on 10 farms, we either did the uttering uh, of the ewes at weaning or four to eight weeks uh, post weaning and we picked up um, twice as many faults by waiting a bit, bit later, which is clearly too late for this year. But we can talk about that another time or you can think about that by looking at the <coughs> promotional material on the Beef and Lamb website. Okay, here we go. So basic principles, as a, some of these I'll go quickly through because we've already covered and we're probably a bit behind. Um, the, as I said, the you can't gain your own fat or body efficient score, in, in, let alone their own live weight in late pregnancy due to those demands. And I showed you that curve. Therefore, poor condition score use, if you're gonna get condition score on them so they can have some fat for buffering in late pregnancy and lactation, has to be either pre-breeding or up to about day 100 of pregnancy. After then, it's too late. Um, and how we feed the UNA pregnancies should be based on number of fetuses, etc. I just want to say that some of, there's a lot of thought out there that the size of the lamb at birth is all based on it, its feeding. Just like I said to you before about uh, ewes getting sleepy sickness, etc. Those fetuses just keep drawing, okay? And you can only actually manipulate birth weight by 10, sometimes some studies as much as 20% depending on how you feed the ewe. It's a very small amount of uh, buffering in terms of uh, fetal growth trajectory that you can do by feeding. It's very small. Because really, what sets up how big that lamb is actually happens the day that the uh, ram breeds with the ewe. It's the combination of the uh, genes for growth that that lamb gets off its parents and the genes that the mother's got to partition nutrients efficiently across that placenta. And I'll show you a graph in the moment, just some very old data. Um, to show you how hard it is to move that birth weight. Um, and the aim really is on our farms, if we're brutally honest, you know, I showed you that graph where I said that the triplet bearing ewes carrying 20 to 22 kilos of conceptus and the, uh, the twin bearing ewes around 18 kilos. Very few of our ewes, can we honestly hand on heart say, oh, you know, she was 60 kilos at mating. I know that she's 22, she's 82 kilos or 22 kilos heavier the day before she lands that triplet bearing ewe. We know that's not occurring on our farms. We know that we, we can't feed them to those levels. So it's really about minimizing how much they've got to use their body uh, condition. You've all had ewes go down pregnancy uh, toxemia or sleepy and die, and then you've dog tuckered them. You know that a skin and bones before they die because they're buffering so much. So it's about limiting that because that'll affect um, how their performance goes in just that lambing and around lambing uh, and therefore milk production and survival. This is some very old data, 1976. Some of you will remember then and some of you won't. But um, basically, I just want you to look at, these are days for mating along the bottom axis here. Um, and there's some work done by, uh, from Rattray, the old uh, Department of Ag days. These are singleton and twin bearing users, the growth trajectory of their fetuses. This is when ewes were fed about pregnancy, mate, pregnancy feeding at around about normal maintenance feeding, so normal, you know, non-pregnant maintenance feeding, and fed well. You know, there's a bugger all difference in birth weight of those lambs. And even in twins here, and this is the combined weight on, on the vertical axis here of the two twins, you know, ad lib feeding a ewe, get, give you two six kilo lambs, and feeding at pregnancy at maintenance, so not even at pregnancy requirements, just those ewes were still giving out five kilo lambs, which just shows you how hard it is to manipulate birth weight. And, and that's that graph again, because it's all about that pressure that goes in late pregnancy. And if I would asked you to come up with a list of, of what underfeeding does in pregnancy, you could all give me something along uh, these lines. And you know, these combined are around about how it affects milk production, these top ones here, which all affects, of course, lamb survival. You know, our lambs are solely dependent on their milk to survive and the growth of those lambs. Feeding, you know, affects the birth weight slightly, as I talked about. Um, and, you know, that can affect whether or not that lambs in that optimum birth weight window. There's no doubt about that at all. If a ewe is in a negative energy balance, in other words, she uh, doesn't have much body fat, she's hungry, she stands up, 
from uh, lambing and she starts eating. She doesn't bond. And that affects lamb survival. Bonding's poorer. And, and, and lambs born from a ewe that's in poor energy uh, status or, or thin ewe, those lambs actually are less vigorous at birth. They take longer to stand. The poor uh, bonding, they take longer to take their first suckle, et cetera. And the poor follow and mother. All of those things above there result in increased ewe and lamb losses. Uh, and of course, we talk about pregnancy toxemia. Flow on effect is lower lamb winning weights, as well as lamb survival. And of course, the flow on effects into next year. So there are all the things from poor nutrition in pregnancy that you're all aware of. Regardless of what the trait is we're talking about, whether it's lamb survival, whether it's ewe milk production, whether it's ewe ovulation rate, conception rate, whether it's quality of semen in the uh, sperm and the ejaculate of the ram, if we look at those traits based on body condition score on my graph here, which is along the bottom here, and production measure, and it's any measure, it pretty much follows this curve response, where as you of a higher and higher condition, you get better and better performance, although the, the, the relative gain in performance is smaller and smaller, until you get to the point around about three to three and a half body condition score, it's pretty much plateaus. Um, and so that's your optimal condition score you, three to three and a half. If you're above three and a half, your performance, whatever the trait is, won't be any higher, but it's cost you more feed because she's fatter. She, it's cost you feed to get there, and it's cost you feed to maintain in there because it has the maintenance cost of that fat. And the thinner the U, the poorer the performance. And clearly there's a greater drop off here. So these are the U's you should be targeting. You know, so if you do use body condition score, and I'd like to think you do, I don't believe it's about you yourself being trained to know the difference between a two, two and a half, oh, is that a two and a half or a three, or is that a three and a three and a half? It's a lot of rubbish. It's about identifying these U's here at the tail end. If you can identify your bottom 20% of your U's, they're having the biggest impact on your overall flock productivity. Because this is such a steep drop off, they're bringing your average down. I also want to say, because it's not a straight line relationship, it's this curve here, don't ever get into the trap to say, I'm, I'm looking for an average you and my flock, I want an average flock condition score of three. Because that's a rubbish number. Because you can get an average flock of three by having all you use at three, and that'd be brilliant, but it's impossible. You could have an average of three by having half your use at four condition score and half your use at two. Well, the fours are too fat and inefficient and the twos are well below your performance. So a flock that had a theoretical flock that had half the use at two and half the use at four, giving you an average flock of condition score three, their performance would be a lot, a lot worse than a flock with are all at three. So it's about thinking about reducing the percentage of use from a year on year basis that are below a condition score of three. And that's what you should be doing. And you should be targeting these animals because they'll give you your biggest bang for your buck in terms of if I put extra feed in them, what extra gain I'll get in terms of performance. And so when are the times the body condition score? I've put four there, pre-breeding, PD, set stocking and weaning. Now, I don't necessarily think you've all got time to do that, but if you actually break that down into what else is going on that is not maybe as hard as you think. You know, weaning on many of your farms is associated or close to weaning with shearing. Okay, and even a blind person can pick uh, poor conditions score use off shears. And it's a good time to do them then because if she's got to gain a condition or a condition a half, you know, that's somewhere between one condition and most of your use is six kilos of live weight to seven kilos. So, you know, that's a big amount of live weight. So from weaning to breeding, breeding gives you time to put on that condition. Some people think about doing it again pre-breeding to identify those thin ewes that they might put some effort in during early pregnancy. <clears throat> but that can be a difficult time. Uh, and, but especially if you've done it at weaning, post shares, you may not need to do that one. Set stocking, uh, sorry, PD, ultrasound scanning. As I said, if you're using ultrasound, Probably most of you use uh, and requiring you to put your hand on their rump or their butt to give them that bit of extra push to get on the crate. Or just move your hand slightly and you can feel whether she's thin or not. Okay, and those ones which are real skinny, just give them a, a mark of some type. Don't stress about whether it's a two or a two and a half. If you can feel her bones, you know she's in trouble. 
And then it sits stocking, or around about sits stocking, mostly you are vaccinating, I hope, especially the value of lambs versus the value, the cost of the vaccine, um, which means most of you are walking through that drenching race, which means you, most of you are touching your sheep. And as you go, just walking your way up, vaccinating, just rub your hand on their back. And again, anything that feels real, real bony, you know she's in trouble, especially if she's multiple bearing. She's in trouble in terms of the chance of her surviving, the chance of one, let alone both of her lambs are surviving, and the, the uh, growth of those lambs. So you, if you break body condition scoring down to simply those activities, it makes it a lot easier, not so uh, labor intensive, which I know many of you are, are one person type jobs on your farm. And also just want to show this graph. I don't like showing too much data and numbers, but <clears throat> how you read this is what we did is we've got a whole lot of views of different condition score uh, and we fed them uh, pellets and in individual pens so we knew exactly how much they ate and then we monitored change in condition score. So we could work out exactly how much energy above normal pregnancy requirements it costs to put on a half a unit of body condition score. So this is the original body condition score, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, et cetera. And this is the body condition score that we move them to. And along, along here, in this diagonal, which I've highlighted in the circles, or oblong shaped circles, um, is how much energy it costs to go up half a condition score. So here's a U of condition score three. To move it to three and a half, costs 242 megajoules of energy. That's a lot of energy on top of energy for maintenance. And you get no bang for your buck in terms of performance increase because she's, she's already at that plateau. The two and a half to move her to a three is 149 megajoules. Okay, but if you can move a two to two and a half, it's 71 megajoules, so half that. But we know because of the slope of that curve I showed you before, you'll get a bigger individual jump in performance. So when you don't have enough feed, you need to think about. Okay, these ones at this end cost me a whole of a lot less feed to put on some condition, and I know I'll get a bigger return than the ones at this end. And the ones at this end cost you a shitload of feed above pregnancy and give you no return. So why feed them the same? The fat one's never going to say to the thin one, oh, yeah, I don't need it, you eat it. That's just not what happens. So it's about targeted feeding to get that increase in condition. And visually, uh, I like to do it with this little graph here. This is just a bell-shaped curve. This is meant to represent a flock. So let's pretend you had a thousand ewes. You know, the average, you know, the, the middle median ewe was a condition score two and a half. You've probably got about a quarter of your flock are in that two and a half to three, and a, a quarter of the flock here in the kind of optimum window. But half your flock are, are really below that two and a half, which is where that graph starts to steeply go down, and so their performance is poor. Now, let's pretend at weaning, you think, oh, my flock, Condition score is not great. I'm going to feed them all well to get them up. Well, you can do that. You can feed them all as one big mob over summer. And it's true. You've got now more by feeding them all, offering them all more. You've got, um, you've moved these use here. So you've got none of these real poor ones. You've got less here and just below two and a half. You've got more in that two and a half to three. And you've got a lot more in that three to three and a half. But you've got now some use have just got fatter. And you've got no advantage. And you feed a lot of grass. If you think back to my graph, uh, my, sorry, my table one slide back, how much grass that cost you for these ones, and even how much grass it cost you for these ones to get them from that two and a half to three, to three and a half. So it's a lot of feed. What you're better to do is split your flock up, hold those ones, and then depending on how much feed you've got, either hold these ones and just target those ones, or if you've got a lot of feed over summer or an early pregnancy, feed them all as a group to gain and just hold these ones at maintenance. And that way you're using less total feed and you're targeting those that will give you the best return because you'll never have enough feed on your farm. A farmer never tells me they have too much feed. So that's called target of feeding. So we're going to integrate that with number of fetuses on board. So as I said, we, we shouldn't be feeding them based on just one. It should be targeted feeding and it should be based on number of the body condition score number of fetuses, whether they're early versus late. And so in terms of what... Well, um, I just, 
Oh, sorry, Paul. Yeah, I'll just take a minute to um, answer a question here or ask you a question from Stacey. Thanks, Stacey. Do many farms on average have crops or additional feed from grass specifically for tapping? In my area, I haven't heard of it being common. Um, no, it's not common, but as Greg alluded to, it depends on where you are in the country and where you are in terms of your bit of the country, is it dry, et cetera. Um, so in drier regions, it's far more common. Um, it may be common also in, in more northern regions also where facial eczema is a, a large issue, as, as Greg talked about, some of those mycotoxins or fungal toxins that live on herbage, um, whether that's things like facial eczema, xeranolone, things like that, getting used off, off those herbages is a way of lifting performance uh, in terms of reproductive performance. Um, but it does, you are correct, it does differ depending on the environment. And of course, depending on where your environment influences which crop options you have as well. So there's no easy right or wrong answer for that. Agree, Greg? You get around a bit more? Yeah, look, um, by and large, yes, uh, totally agree. I think uh, one of the um, the issues that I recall in Taranaki a few years ago was uh, quite a severe um, episode of facial eczema. And, and if um, a, an autumn forage crop or something that you can take through into that um, that danger period is on hand, it is a great tool to um, alleviate some of the, um, uh, I guess, longer term issues that you, you face with um, the prospect of facial eczema in Taranaki. Um, of course, uh, Taranaki is a hill country uh, sheep and beef province and, and you don't always have lots of uh, room for crops, but um, you know, as far as future-proofing your, your operation, um, you know, breeding for um, facial eczema tolerance um, and is one option, but short of that, um, yeah, forage crops are, are a, great, uh, a great option. Um, and as Paul said, it, it depends entirely where you are. Um, I think all dry land uh, areas tend to have a high proportion of um, autumn feed available for, for stock. Yep, um, yeah. And so the other thing to think about, if you think about facial eczema, and again, you know, many of your farms, you'll be limited on how much space you've got to put in crops. You know, your old ewes, um, maybe you're, you're less worried about the investment you've got put in them versus how much return you're going to get in future years. If you don't have enough, you know, maybe they wouldn't go on the crop of your, if your two twos, four twos, et cetera, the ones that you want to last many years in your flock, you know, you can start targeting also which ones go on the, on the crop um, from a, if you don't have enough perspective to get you out of some of the issues with some of the mycotoxins. Um, okay, so in early pregnancy, um, we, we have views on really maintenance and maintenance, to be, uh, the amount of maintenance requirements obviously is affected by how big your ewes are because different amount of feed uh, requirements based on your body weight, but it's somewhere between the allowance of 1.2 to 1.5 kilograms of dry matter per day. Now, again, there's a beef and lamb uh, ready feed calculator that you can use uh, to help with that because it'll all depend on, on the weight of your, your animals. Um, if you're starting to graze, really, this is based on pasture, grazing below, you know, seven, 600 kilograms of dry matter, you, you're starting to affect with an animal can meet the maintenance requirement. Um, if you have got some poor body condition score use and you know that, um, and you're from a highly fecund flock, straight out of breeding, um, they are the ones that you might put on slightly above, say like in a truck and trailer approach. Um, you might put 10 or 15% of your use just to hear the rotation, um, that are in poor condition because you want uh, them to gain a bit of a condition then, because you know that they're gonna be, if your flock's highly fecund, they, and chances are, most of them are gonna be carrying multiples. Um, Again, as I said to you before, you know, pregnancy scanning is a good time to do that body condition score. And again, um, if you haven't done it since weaning, um, and that knowledge with the fetuses allows you to set some uh, targets. And it's about knowing those early versus late. And in that first slide I talked about, uh, sorry, that first talk I talked about, if you're breeding for three cycles, just that huge variation in, in stage of pregnancy they're in and their demand. Well, just, just uh, while you're on that slide, we've got another question that's come in from uh, James Bryan. Um, on a slightly different topic, but just regarding pre-lamb shearing, what effect does this have on lamb development? What, if any, are the production benefits? So just while you're talking about mid-pregnancy nutrition, it's, yep. uh, I guess it's, it's timely to talk about that now too. Okay, so mid-pregnancy shearing, 
Um, I've been involved with research in that since 1998, so I can be pretty confident in what I tell you. So mid pregnancy shearing is a tool to increase fetal growth of twins and triplets. And it's a tool to get that lamb slightly heavier and within that optimum uh, birth weight range. And studies have shown, even you know, big studies where they had like hundreds of animals, not just small little on-farm research university ones, but ones with big hundreds of animals, um, you can improve lamb survival uh, percentage points by three to five percent. So you can have a, quite a response. And it can reduce also um, you casting and death rates of use via uh, casting, because Sean is less likely to cast. However, you'll only get that increase in um, survival response if she's fed well. So if you're feeding her to pregnancy requirements at that stage of mid-pregnancy, not in non-pregnancy requirements. So she, you know, that, that extra fetal growth doesn't come out of the air. She has to be eating a bit more. Um, and she has to have some body reserves. <clears throat> we did large, <coughs> sorry, large scale studies, and we know that a ewe with a body condition score of two versus a ewe with a body condition score of three, you will not get the increase in birth weight uh, from mid pregnancy shearing from the ewes with a body condition score of two because she's got no fat to give when she feels cold and she speeds up her metabolism because she's cold and breaks down that body fat to keep her warm and more of that energy crosses the placenta. You won't get the bigger lamb birth weights and therefore you won't get the survival response. So you can actually be targeted if you really want to, and I know most farmers don't want to because it becomes a pain. Thin ewes, don't mid pregnancy share them uh, unless you just want to donate some money to the shearer. Um, if you're doing it from a perspective of getting a uh, lamb survival response because it won't work. It's also a fallacy to think if I share my ewes in mid pregnancy, that when she goes to lamb, she'll seek shelter. That's a lot of bullshit. Um, if you're using the cover or snow comb, which under the Welfare Act you're required to, um, that'll leave seven to nine millimetres of stubble at shearing. Then if you're mid pregnancy shearing, you're 70 days away at least from lambing, she'll grow 0.3 of a millimetre of wool a day, so that's another 21 mils of wool. Um, plus she's got that seven to nine mils, so she's got three centimetres of wool at lambing. She don't feel the cold. It's only us as humans that have made them grow that much. You know, two centimetres of wool, or 20 millimetres, at zero degrees, with no wind run or rain, so on a nice frosty morning, a ewe is thermal neutral, which means she doesn't feel cold or hot. So with 30 millimetres, or three centimetres of wool, it might be windy out there, but she don't give a shit. And so she won't go looking for that shelter. So mid pregnancy shearing, your survival response is about getting that lamb bigger at birth. And that only occurs if you can feed her slightly above uh, pregnancy requirements, and she's of good body condition. So I think that answers that question, hopefully, and probably gave you too much detail. Um, so if we go back onto the feeding, you know, you're, you're selling your non-pregnant ewes based on scanning as well. And as I said, you know, you're giving the ewes, of identifying those real poor skinny ones when you're pushing them onto uh, that crate. And we talked about that graph because, you know, mid-pregnancy, you're here somewhere, you see, you've got a small window to put on some condition before she gets to here and she physically can't do it. And of course, you know, those late lambing ewes are more likely down here. So they've got more time. And once you know how many fetuses you've got on board, it's about thinking about on your farm, what your cover is. You know for the number of years you've been on the farm, on average, how much grass you're gonna grow. And therefore, you know based then if you're in trouble or not. And then once you know that, you start planning about how I'm gonna run my rest of winter rotation. How am I gonna manage uh, my ewes, because now I know how many fetuses I've got on a board, you've got an idea of uh, how many of those thin ones you've got, and you can think about, okay, can I afford two or three mobs through winter, and how will I create those mobs based on uh, body condition, uh, early lammers, and those uh, ewes with triplet bearing, etc. And if you're in trouble, start thinking about how am I going to get out of it in terms of supplements, buying in supplements, but you know, that's not easy. Um, at all because of the ability to feed those supplements out if you haven't already put a crop in. Paul, well, just on that, um, what do you consider a feed deficit? Can you express that in terms of kilograms of dry matter at the, uh, the commencement of lambing or at peak lactation? Yep. So um, the further you are away from um, 1,200 kilograms of dry matter, the further you are away 
from uh, you peak performance. You intake uh, of our ewes on our type of grass, and let's be honest, most of you got brown top um, with 2% clover. Um, intake is not restricted in a ewe when she doesn't have to graze below 1200. So as soon as you are forcing her in late pregnancy and in lactation to graze below 1200, you're getting a drop off in performance. And if you think about your dairy uh, cattle cousins or neighbors, they will tell you at, at peak, you know, at, at uh, late pregnancy, they, they have clear body condition score targets for their cows and they have feed on, on, uh, on board to make sure those cows get as much feed as they can uh, so they maximize milk production, total peak. And really that's what you need to be doing because total peak will affect how heavy your lambs are at weaning. So if you're in a situation your feed budget is telling you you're well below 1,200, uh, you're in trouble in terms of your performance. Now, if you're slightly below 1,200, then you can do a bit of manipulation around uh, all well, those singleton bearing ewes. If you've got a few of them, I can push them. Um, but in a highly fecund flock, if you're a long way below 1,200, um, you're in trouble. And that also comes back to then thinking about your mating date. Are you mating too early so that pasture covers aren't starting to come away? It's a false economy to lamb early, to think, oh, my lambs will be born early, so I've got more time to get away from the Christmas market. A number of studies showed in the late 80s, early 90s, which is a while ago now, that for every week you lamb earlier, you need to be an extra 100 kilograms above that 1,200 from optimal lambing time. So let's pretend your optimal lambing time in Taranaki in terms of is, I don't know, I'm just guessing, right? I'll, I'll make up a date of uh, 15th of September um, and, and you optimally lamb then and, you, and your cover's 1,200, that's a perfect scenario to be in. Um, the covers aren't going below 1,200. If you're to lamb, say, a week earlier on the 8th of September, you needed to, have to be a minimum paddock cover of 1,300. Another week earlier, 1,400. Because what happens is, though your grass hasn't come away, but you use have to eat it, so they're eating into the cover because their demand is so much above what you can grow and so cover comes down. So the earlier lamb, that uh, minimum cover of 1,200 needs to be even higher. Does that cover enough, Greg? Absolutely, thank you. Good, okay. Just also remember some people think, oh, I'm in mid-pregnancy, you know, you've showed me that graph, Paul, and, and there's not a lot going on, I can push her a bit harder, but then what that graph doesn't show you is your sheep are growing wool. And so in mid Pregnancy, it's a day 60 or 70 where the, the, the fetus is still pretty small, just a few hundred grams, and the placenta is small, she's still growing wool. So she, her total weight change uh, in terms of the pregnancy part plus the wool is somewhere, depending on your genotype, the number of fetuses, 30 to 50 grams per day uh, going on. So unless she's at least gaining in that level, she's actually losing her own weight. In other words, she's burning her own fat, and she won't have that for late pregnancy and lactation. So, you know, do need to consider that. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So then, you know, from day 70 onwards, you should be increasing your allowance to 1.5 to 1.8 kilograms of dry matter per day. The way you physically do that is, is uh, increase the post-grazing mass from that 700 or so up to 800 or 900 if she's highly fecund, which is around about three centimetres. Um, that's how you do that. Now, again, singletons clearly and late lambing ewes can be held further back. Um, some of you may be using brassicas, which are a great feed source in mid-pregnancy. Um, but just think of a little bit about utilisation. Farmers get a bit excited about how much uh, brassica they've got available. But do think about really what, what is your true utilisation. You know, you think your paddock's got high utilisation because it's pretty clean, but a lot of it is walked in. Um, so just think about a utilisation factor in there and, and making sure she's eating around that 1.2 to 1.3 a day. For most of our users, over 65 kilos, which is the case on many of your farms. Um, if feed is short, well, you know, as I said, you know, push those singletons harder. They can cope with it. You know, you often hear older farmers talk about the 70s and the 80s when you had subsidies. It was about the skinny you days. You knew you could get away with it with those singleton bearing ewes back then, um, because you were getting those subsidies based on numbers of animals. Um, and we know that the singleton we pushed pretty hard. Those later lambing ewes, you know, holding them back as well. Is important. If you've got some very good condition score twin bearing ewes, you can hold them back as well. And none of you'd ever do this, but of course, you know, you can think of selling some livestock in winter. Um, 
think about which ewes are going to give you least return. You know, your, your, is it your later lambing ewes you could sell? Is it your single bearing ewes you, should, you could sell? Because clearly they're maximum only going to give you one lamb. Whereas a twin bearing ewe fed well um, with high lamb survival should win you more total lamb anyway. As you get further into pregnancy, we're getting higher and higher post raising covers. Two to three weeks before lambing, you know, she needs to be offered 1.7 to 2.4 kilograms per day. Um, and again, you're starting to think about then um, if there's not enough feed, what you do. And often, two to three weeks before lambing, that's when many of you are vaccinating. So it allows you to start making those decisions, you know, holding those later lambing ewes back. You know, later lambing ewes can be held back quite a bit because when they go to lamb, you are, you know, when they lamb, whether they're second cycle, third cycle ewes, that's well past when you, you're hopefully growing a lot of grass because you've timed mating so that your first cycle use ideally a lambing when you're growing grass. So, you know, they can be pushed quite, quite a bit because there's going to be a lot of feed around when they get to lamb. And again, those singletons holding them back, etc. So again, I'm not talking about having 10 mobs. I'm talking about maybe getting the use in two or three times and reprioritizing a bit based on the information that you know, whether she's carrying one, two or three lambs, whether she's early or late, or whether she's really skinny. Paul, well, look, just um, want to interrupt you there again, and sorry for doing so. I'm just conscious that we're, we've now reached 2.30, and this is the uh, the, the planned um, stop time, and I know that uh, some of our audience may need to get going. I just really um, want to, uh, I guess, let them know that if they do need to get going, please don't feel... Um, uh, guilty about signing off and going and doing other things if you need to go and do other things um, but in saying that Paul um, how much longer do you think um, you've got in your presentation just so that you can give people a bit of an idea or a guide for, for time frames only five minutes five minutes just five just minutes formal slides yep okay so, um, post set stocking you don't be restricting intake which is at 1200 Greg asked me about before and when you're doing that, it's allowance of three to four kilos because they need to be eating two and a half to, to nearly three kilos, depending off a twin or triplet bearing. And at, at the other end of the scale, if you offer them over 1,800, you might feel better about it, but she can't physically eat anymore. So you're wasting feed there. So just think about there's an optimum window, 12 to 1,800. That's how much she's got to eat. That's my nine uh, size nine red band. And that's clearly in a, in, a, in a dairy farm. We get the students to, to, to cut it. As a, as a practice exercise, see how much feed, but that's how much she has to eat in a day. A twin bearing or, and triplet bearing you in that late pregnancy, first week of lactation, second week of lactation. That's a shitload of feed if she's not going to use her body reserves. Okay, and your grass isn't that long, you know, and your ewes didn't have that good of teeth. So they're really pushing hard to eat that amount in a day. And remember, they're a ruminant, they've got to keep bringing it up and regurgitate it and, and ruminate on it. So it's not easy. That's the animal you, we've created because we know we make money out of selling lambs. And we've gone for more for fertility for coming to. Late pregnancy, avoid the bulky feeds. For Christ's sake, don't be feeding brassicas in those last few weeks, the 90% water. So that pile there, if you're feeding them just brassica bulb, would have to be 30 kilos of brassica bulb. That's a wheelbarrow full. Okay? And if their teeth aren't great, that's like sucking on stones. Um, and a hay's not great. I'm not going to get into concentrate supplements because we don't use them a lot in New Zealand, but in other parts of the world they do. We have problems in New Zealand with cheap grain and how to utilise them. Set stocking, you should be planning a bit set stocking now as you go into your winter rotation and thinking about, I know which paddocks on my farm have the best lamb survival. Therefore, I'm going to be putting my twins and triplets in them. Therefore, I do not want my winter rotation to be going through them just before set stocking because I want to maximise the time those paddocks have left to recover. So thinking about the order of your rotation is important for setting up your paddocks to have good covers in for lambing for those ewes that need it the most, which are those highly fecund ewes in poor condition. And then your set stocking based on feed demand. Just show you why that's important. This is uh, Tom Fraser, which some of you might know. He created this graph using some data from Australia. This is intake of the ewe in lactation. This is ME. So if you divide by 12, it'll tell you how much kilograms of dry matter. So this is about two and a half kilograms of dry matter here. If you can feed the ewe two and a half kilograms of dry matter, it doesn't matter if she's a body condition score one, two, three, or four, milk production will be the same. But when you're in a scenario where she can't eat that two and a half kilos of dry matter a day because pasture covers have got too low, 
she'll be eating less, so she'll be further along this way of the graph. And you can see the impact of body condition score then on milk production. Now that doesn't matter if she's a single bearing ewe, two kilos, uh, two litres of milk is more than enough for that single lamb. But if she's a twin or triplet bearing lamb and you want lambs to live and be decent at weaning, there's a big variation of a, a litre a day of milk production based on her body condition. And that's why body condition and thinking about body condition and how much grass you're offering her and lactation is important if you want to maximise land growth and survival. Just do want to say though, our triplet bearing ewes can't physically eat any more than our twin bearing ewes of grass because you know their rib cage stops how much they can eat and that placenta and conceptus is growing, then the rumen does get smaller. So if you can be 100% sure you're not grazing below 1200 kilograms in uh, late, very late pregnancy and lactation, from a nutritional point of view, there's no benefit from separating twin and triple bearing use. You might feel better, better, better about it, but in fact, she can't physically eat anymore. Okay? Of course, we're often not in that scenario. And if you're below 1,200, then on average, then it's your above 1,200 paddocks that should go to your triplets. Okay? But from a pure nutritional point of view, your triple bearing youth can't physically eat any more than their twin bearing youth. So if you're feeding her ad adequately, you don't have to separate if that's a pain in, in the butt for you in terms of your paddocks. Um, there are alternative herbages you can use for lambing, for stocking, lucerne, chicory, plantain, clovers. They're all very good, but they also have their own uh, feeding requirements and minimums like eight centimetres, etc. But also be aware, if you can't lamb on them because they're not growing on your, uh, on your farm at that stage, and you definitely don't want to grow, go on them too early because you can kill those plants, that very good lamb growth rates can still occur by walking in the ewes on there, say around about tailing. We know it can help hold up the lactation curve and improve lamb growth to any. So that's all I wanted to say. I was probably a bit quick in those last couple of slides. I can ask questions, but if people have to go, um, that's okay. So feeding and pregnancy is about thinking about the condition of the ewe, her stage of pregnancy, number of fetuses, the amount of feed you have available, and then using that information for targeted feeding.